Yo, yo, I'm like an addict, do I gotta have it? I ain't even playing, got a really bad habit. If it All right, this is the EFR podcast, number 39. I'm Sammy B, your loyal host, along with James Lyman. And then on my bottom left, John to Don Sterling, we are the EFR podcast. Uh, this is a special episode. Uh, we, we, we had the, the, the distinguished guest of uh, getting someone from, uh, you know, one of the biggest tech, if not the biggest tech company in the world, what, what 1.3, 1.5 trillion dollar market cap, uh, something like that. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm getting that correct. Uh, definitely over a trillion uh, in, in, in market cap, market cap space. Um, the person that I, I, I have the pleasure of interviewing uh, actually kind of, the interview kind of came on my lap actually. And um, through different forums, I was uh, kind of migrating through. Uh, I was able to meet this individual and uh, we were able to connect because he actually handles the, the so, social, social media um, manager or operator for Amazon's cloud web division, which is actually, and you know, he let me know besides the retail division, it's actually the biggest division under Amazon, which actually operates separately as an ind independent entity uh, from Amazon, uh, which is really uh, interesting because I always, you know, from the news recordings that we've covered, the retail division is act, you know, was always saying they were always saying that. It's the biggest division, but he let me know that uh, the Amazon Web Cloud division is the biggest division under Amazon. And um, he, he does a lot of big festivals. He's a social media influencer. You can see him on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, tweet him, you know, real soulful guy. We have my man, can I get a one-time, one-time soul clap for Alex Wayman here? On the oh, no. our podcast, Economic and Finance Report. One time, one time, soul clap, soul clap. Thank you, Alex, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Cool. Let's let's start with your background, man. How did you um where where, where you come from? Where where, where where do you what is you know before you become Alex Wayman, you know uh you know you have to come from somewhere, right? You have to come from the internet. You got to come. What city, state? Where where do you come from? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'll I'll keep it short here. I was actually born in Russia, so uh, I'm first generation American. Um, moved here, lived in Atlanta, Georgia for a while, so spent some time in the South, and then moved up to uh, Portland, Oregon, which is where I lived for quite a few years before I ended up coming up here to Seattle uh, for work. Basically, I um, graduated from UW University of Washington, and I got a job at Apple, and that's pretty much why I moved up to the Seattle area. And then since then, switched to Amazon, got involved in music heavily, um, all kinds of different stuff. Seattle is a very exciting city. There's always a lot of really cool things happening. So it's a really creative uh, space to, to live in. Community. Nice. Yeah. Wow, man. Um, we're, we're, we're a podcast that focuses on the economy, finance, business. And um, you being in the tech space, you, you mentioned that you, you started in the Apple. What, what were you doing at, at Apple? You know that you know. Let's let's talk about that before we go into Amazon. Uh, yeah. That, how, how did you get to the Apple, and what were you doing? Yeah, uh, at Apple, I worked at the Genius Bar, so fixing phones uh, at the store level. Um, that was pretty much it. My degree was in technology management uh, from the UW, which was kind of a new program at the time when I went, um, and that just kind of it just kind of segued into that job. I actually I think I just had a mutual friend that worked at Apple, and they got me an interview. Then, you know, did the whole resume thing and got my foot in the door that way. Um, and that was a really great experience. Apple's a great company to work for. Um, yeah, I had thought about going further with Apple, actually, but then uh, I got a pretty good offer from Amazon to, to come in and work with the AWS division, which Amazon Web Services is like that scalable infrastructure component of Amazon. Um, nice. Yeah. nice. Uh, all right, so you you worked for for Apple um, in like a retail, I guess the retail capacity, right? Um, and so, what is what is technology management? Maybe is that a is that a math? I mean, is that a bachelor of science or what is that bachelor of arts? Or something yeah, I got a bachelor technology. of arts for it, but it's uh, I mean, it it was like like I said, it was a new program at the time. Essentially, it talk it it focuses on 
innovating and managing technology for business purposes. So it's about how do we take or how do we build, how do we take these tools out there uh, and make them better and make them work for us in the business. Um, and it's just the management of that process. Like, oh, we're going to incorporate a new tool. What's that going to look like? What's the workflow? How do we train our teams on it? Things like that. Wow. So you, you focused, I mean, like I, I had a back, I have a background in uh, media, I have an MBA in media management. Uh, James, I mean, you, you, you also have an IT background, uh, you being the elder of the, of the, of the show, <laughs> you know, well, what, I have a double E as well as <laughs> other degrees. What, what, what do you think about what he's talking about, about technology management? I mean, was that something that you kind of you understand what he's, he's speaking about? Well, it's a little bit like my graduate work from USC uh, on uh, uh, systems management. And it was uh, half project management for development of new systems. So, yeah, I know what he's talking about. Okay, cool. So, I mean, do you think that is, it, you know, from when you, your, your heyday uh, to where, like, you know, when he, when, when did you graduate, may I ask? Uh, when did you uh, graduate? Yeah. When, no, uh, no, not, not, not you, James. Um, uh, oh. Alex, when did you, when did you graduate? Uh, from UW, uh, 2016. Okay. So like, is that, was that like a transition James to what he, you know, I mean, all the time, different syllabuses expand. Does that, does that kind of lead into what he, he's doing? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, cool, cool. Um, so you get into Apple, uh, you, you, you leave the Apple, uh, with your your technology management background and you how do you seek amazon or, or was there like a, a pause before getting into amazon and how did that how did that connection come about no it was pretty direct i uh i had a mutual contact that was already working at amazon um and i don't know i guess a lot of networking i'm a huge networking guy and um i just knew people that worked there they got me an interview um and i got in the door actually in somewhat of a technical customer service role um, for AWS. Um, AWS at the time was pretty popular, but still um, lacked sort of like uh, corporate structure. Uh, so our team was pretty small. Like our entire support team was like maybe 25 people for this multi-million dollar division of Amazon. It was pretty crazy. Um, so we had a lot of flexibility and we had to build tools. We had to build our own internal tools for managing case workflows, um, managing any kind of customer contacts basically related to AWS and AWS again is really technical. So there isn't, it's not like retail where it's like, Hey, I need a return processed. It's uh, like, I'm building a website. I need help troubleshooting that. Um, so it was pretty technical. Um, and I did that for a few years uh, and then eventually switched over to the uh, social media side because it was actually more fun for me. Nice, nice. I liked it more. So Amazon, they, 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 they're big on automation. You know, it sounds like, you know, I'm hearing a lot of automation type of uh, uh, lingo that, you, that you're stating. Yeah. Uh, I would is, that, say is that a big processes in, in, in Amazon? I would say, uh, yeah. So I, what I was talking about is more like SOPs, like just like, operating procedures for teams. Um, but automation is very critical for sure. I mean, on a, for a company that size. So yeah, we, we absolutely just always try to innovate new ways to uh, lessen our workload or like actual direct workload. Cause you know, with automation, it's like, if you do anything over and over again, there's no reason why you have to do that. Find a way to just automate it, get it out of the way. Um, yeah. And uh, James, I think you, you can come in, come in after after uh, what I have to say, James actually has written a lot of uh, on our website, which we have uh, economic and finance report.com, you know, shameless plug. Um, he, he actually writes <laughs> about that automation that you're speaking of. Maybe James, you'd want to ask him some, some more questions on that in that regard. Uh, well, how are you using automation? Is it to uh, uh, search through the content of uh, your social media, looking for things like uh, terrorist activities and uh, uh, racial and, and, and other hate groups? 
developing or is it for actually developing your product? Because I think this will be something in the near future where you'll start seeing uh, writing of code being automated. Uh, you look at the technology from uh, IBM, their uh, uh, Watson and uh, what it did with Jeopardy. And you can't help but wondering, uh, will this start coming into the software programming areas and uh, start automating that process? I would completely agree with that. I think there's actually already even tools out there um, that already sort of have like autofill for code generation. So you can pretty much tell it what you want it to do and it writes it in Python or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it's, that's pretty, I feel like that's definitely going to be that next wave. Uh, for us, you're right. We, we use automation a lot for things like scraping Twitter, um, for scraping, for any kind of communications related to Amazon, because we want visibility at the very least. You know, we want to catch um, anybody that uses the word Amazon or AWS or has any kind of possibly negative sentiment. Like we want to see that and then decide if we want to do anything with it. And we, uh, we definitely, you know, catch a lot of things um, that 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 i'm thankful that we catch they should not go unnoticed you know like things like you said um i don't i don't want to say terrorism or anything like that but just like pr related uh crises you know or things that we yeah look out for um and then of course you know there's a lot of political movements that like the world's crazy right now so like mm. things are changing all over the place so we you know we we look at any instance of amazon aws in those kinds of conversations um just for visibility and if something needs to be done because of it then you know we we treat it appropriately mm -hmm. why why is um obviously you know um amazon's the parent company why is the why is uh, aws like a separate entity um or operated as a separate entity a part of amazon you know because even, yeah. even if they do their books i mean are they obviously that division is a part of the annual, you know, the annual books, you know, because uh, Amazon has a board, right? So yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, it's technically all under Amazon Inc. Right. So it's not a separate company. It's just a separate division of Amazon, like prime Video is one thing. Um, right. Amazon.com, the retail store is one is the e-commerce store is one thing as well. AWS is one thing. Then you have like all these other services that are um, offered. Amazon Fresh is technically its own entity within Amazon. Um, so, so it's just how, how they divide it. Um, I don't know, I don't really know the historical origin of why that happened with AWS. Um, I do know that it came from the idea that the, basically the amazon.com store is hosted on these servers that we own. Um, and we've just built up so many of these servers around the world. We have these massive data centers now we eventually got to a point where the company said it makes more sense for us now financially to actually lease out the space to other companies. So they started renting out their infrastructure and that became AWS, which is mm. what I work for. So anybody that launches an instance, a server with AWS is using the same infrastructure that amazon.com is hosted on. We just decided to let people borrow our hardware. Basically that's kind of, <laughs> how, that's how it started. Understood. And now um, it's, it's the most profitable division of Amazon. See, and this is where me and you argue because I was reading that the retail was, or it's going, it's actually the retail is going to surpass Walmart because right now Walmart, but in 2022, uh, they said the retail division is going to be most profitable. But why do you, why do you, why do you negate that, that finding? Well, I just remember reading a report at the end of last year um, that AWS was the, um, most profitable, but I'm, I'm trying to find, I'm trying to fact check myself now because I want to make sure I don't say something wrong. Um, yeah, we got an email about it and. Uh, well, I mean, you have, you have the, because the thing is like a couple of days ago, they were saying that, uh, they were saying that the retail division was going to surpass Walmart. Uh, yeah, I believe that for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, totally. Well, you know, so that, that'll be interesting. All right, so maybe you can kind of delve into like uh, the AWS a little bit more and kind of explain like the the dynamics of that uh, division so people can have a clearer understanding. Because from what I know of it, it's being the cloud, the web cloud. Uh, I guess we want I want to use infrastructure or the web cloud division of Amazon. But maybe you can give a, a clearer picture, a 
of what that exactly means, AWS, and what that is, you know, symbolized under Amazon. Sure. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, it's and everything online on like a, on a website is hosted on a server typically, which is like a computer, like a physical computer, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and the cloud is just basically the connectivity to these massive data centers, data farms that have hundreds of thousands of these computers stacked. That is the cloud, basically. Uh, we have these facilities around the world that have hundreds of thousands of these computers, different computing powers, some that are designed for graphics, some are designed for just simple computing. Um, and they're all over the, all over the world. We have them in countries all over, all over the planet. Um, Basically, anybody who wants to create a website for themselves or wants to create an app or wants to create an e-commerce store can come to AWS and use our infrastructure. We have these servers where they can host their databases, host their um, object storage for like, if they're just hosting images online, they can also run programs. Um, anything that a computer can do, they can do through AWS, basically, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's that's dope. Um, and so how, you, how and, you, go ahead, go I was ahead. gonna wondering just financially, the cost wise, how does essentially renting computer power compared with people having uh, uh, their own in house? Uh, it looks like it would be for uh, computers and the high graphics doing computer generated uh, animation and the such that takes big computers, big computing powers, I could see renting it. But for a lot of businesses where instead of using uh, uh, their IBM or the, uh, an Apple, uh, renting out the system, how does that compare cost-wise? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I don't really know anybody that hosts their own website from their own computer. Um, mm -hmm. It's really not what people do. People go to like Squarespace or Wix or any of those website building sites, which all they are is essentially middlemen to something like AWS. In fact, companies like Squarespace and Wix actually use AWS for hosting their services. Um, it's just all on the back end. It's not public. It's, I mean, Netflix uses AWS, um, Apple uses AWS. We are the infrastructure behind these corporations. Okay. So from a, from a pricing standpoint, you're, you're right. It, you know, you could buy a, a nice fancy computer for yourself, or you could rent this, the usage of a virtual machine because it's virtual for you. It's physical for us. Obviously it's hardware uh, at a fraction of the cost. So instead of paying three grand for a nice processor on a computer, you can use this one virtually remote access into it, get the same performance ability um, remotely from in a different part of the world um, for, you know, two or three cents an hour our billings typically on an hourly basis for that wow. kind of service. All right, I have, I have a qu question to piggyback on that. When you, um, it's almost like, like also like with the telecom, uh, it's almost sounds like, like almost like the same thing that telecom does where like Verizon or like T-Mobile, like they, you have the smaller home companies using their towers. Um, mm -hmm. Is it, how, how does, how does, I mean, like when Jeff, when Jeff Bezos started uh, Amazon, what, 1996, 1997, did he just say, you know what, I'm going to put facilities all around the world, and then I know that these companies can kind of lease the stuff that we have? Like, how does that work? And yeah, why, why well, would, like, a Netflix uh, go to an Amazon when they're a leader in their, in their, own, um, their, own, their own right? Like, why, yeah, why wouldn't so, Netflix right. create their own facility in their own, you know, for, you know, whatever niche that they're, they're controlling? You sure, know what I mean? Yeah. Two, two questions there, right? So the first one, I don't, uh, Bezos did not have that plan because he never wanted to step into the space originally. He, I, I don't know his full story, but if you watch his interviews, he said he created Amazon for his books. He wanted to sell books around the world, right? Mm -hmm. And part of the fulfillment process included setting up facilities in other parts of the world in order to get people books faster. Because if you, all your books come from North Virginia and somebody orders it in China, it's going to take weeks to get there. But if you have a fulfillment center in China already, you can store a percentage of your of your inventory in China and get that book to them in a day, right? And mm -hmm. so it just makes more sense for him to have these facilities all over the world. As Amazon.com grew and grew in popularity, he realized that people were ordering things from all around the world and all this traffic to the um, to the store demanded higher levels of computing power, which is when they started doing exactly like what you said Netflix could do is they're like, you know what, screw it. Why do I want to pay somebody to host when I can just buy a bunch of computers myself? 
and put it in my garage and put some AC in there so they don't overheat. You know, that's basically what Bezos thought. I'm assuming, I don't know his exact thought process, but that's what I would have thought of. And then he decided to scale that upwards. And then as more and more people started using Amazon, um, people wanted to set up their own e-commerce store, e-commerce stores. Bezos said, well, let's just let other people use our hardware. We already have these server racks that, you know, we can't, don't even always fully use. Um, let's let other people start using it. And then that started scaling as they developed the business model. But when you, when you speak about the cloud, the AWS, I look at it more of a, 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 like, a, like, a cl- like it's cloud. So shouldn't that be more power oriented or some type of um, digital orientation? Where does the physical orientation to have actually physical facilities for the cloud development? I'm not, I'm well, the, the, the facilities are not for development. They're just, that's just where the, the hardware is. Because again, the cloud is just, you're connecting through the waves Right. to a piece of hardware, to a computer. Oh, okay, so, okay, I see what you're saying. So that's how, that's all, there's nothing actually happening here. You're just connecting through it to the hardware. Right, right. Um, so yeah, you, you could absolutely, like I said, Netflix could decide that they wanna buy 10,000 servers for their facility, um, but A, it's expensive. B, it takes a lot of upkeep. It takes a lot of maintenance and management of these servers to make sure that they're operating well. Um, I mean, because they're at risk for everything that a normal computer would be overheating, damage, um, you know, any kind of like piracy or spyware or malware or phishing, things like that. Um, So what you're also getting with Amazon is you're getting the maintenance of these servers. So Netflix uses us because instead of them having to worry about it, they just pay us a fraction of what it would cost them to do it themselves. And they know that we're good at what we do and we'll take care of it, basically. Understood. Alex, maybe you could uh, comment on economy of scales uh, in the virtual world. Some thoughts there. Um, in the virtual world, like what specifically um, are we scaling here? In terms well, of the economies of scale, you normally, the, the larger your production, the lower your cost in the, in the physical world. Right. How does that compare with uh, uh, the virtual world? Yeah, I mean, I think it can, uh, it exists in very much the same way, depending mm-hmm. on what you're doing in the cloud. For example, um, with AWS, we have, uh, I mean, this is the first thing that comes to mind, we have these things called reserved instances, where corporations, as they know that they need to scale upwards in production and go from 10,000 servers to 100,000 servers, we give them discounts as they go up basically. Mm -hmm. Um, We also have a thing where uh, you can basically purchase a lease for an extended period of time for these servers. So instead of paying hourly, uh, you know, for this one type of an instance, you can give, you can promise us that you're going to use it for three years. And because of that, we're going to reduce your hourly at the promise of the full three-year payments, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Basically like a signed contract. It's like what you get with a phone when you go to Verizon and they'll give you a payment plan, but you have to keep the phone for two or three years or whatever. So people, or even like a landlord, you know what I mean? If you break your lease, you know, you still have to pay. Yeah. Um, So do they, they have the same contingent, even if people break, they still have to pay the, the, the lease or the contract that they, that they uh, signed up for, right? Typically. Yep. Yep. Unless under, you know, extreme circumstances, it can get reviewed, but that requires levels of escalation. And unless you're like Netflix, uh, you're probably not going to get that broken. So let's talk, let's talk about the social media aspect. You know, I mean, you moved into uh, AWS's social media. I guess you are you like the director, or what's your you're the head uh, the head honcho? Nah, head head? <laughs> nah. I wish I'm a head, I'm a head honcho at what I do for my own. <laughs> but, um, we all are. We all are, man. We all are. <laughs> yeah. No. At Amazon, uh, I'm just on a team. We have a team of I think we just grew to like twelve or thirteen people. Um, and, uh, we basically just manage the social media visibility of AWS specifically. Now each division of Amazon has their own social media team. So amazon.com has one, Amazon prime has a team, Amazon fresh, I think has a team. Um, I'm on the AWS side of things. Right. Do you do a lot of posting or like do celebrities kind of come at you guys to be like, Hey man, my internet is not, sometimes, sometimes. Most people, it's funny though, most people don't really know AWS, you know, it's 
because again, we're not we're not the face of most of these companies. We're on the right, back. Right. Like, there are so many non-disclosures signed with some of these corporations because they don't want people to know that they're using Amazon for their hosting. Right. Um, so we're typically on the back end, but the developers, like the developer community, they do know us, and they're the ones that will usually um, chime in about you know random things, whether they want something new, like a new feature, a new product, uh, or if something's just like not working. You, like you, I, I was telling you before we got on, we had an outage today in uh, North Virginia. Some of our um, some of our RDS instances were having some malfunctions, you know, and that kind of stuff happens. It's just hardware. So so you guys, you guys also you, you cross. Uh... I guess you guys cross um, cross populate with the other divisions or no? Yeah, like, definitely. Yeah. yeah, like if somebody will like tweet at me and be like, "Hey, I need to return my whatever," I'd be like, yeah. "No, go talk to these guys." No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, like as far as like helping uh, each division out if they need certain, I guess, cloud services. I don't know if every, you know, only the only thing I would say that probably the retail and probably I don't know, you know, the deal with uh, MGM, you know, as far as the movie division. Right. Uh, I guess with the Amazon Prime, I mean, those to, to me are probably like the main divisions that you probably, but there's probably like you guys help, you know, help those other divisions or whatever. Totally. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, yeah, because everything that's built within Amazon is built with AWS. It's our own hardware, it's right. our own infrastructure, our own right. programs that we write. Um, yeah, it's all internal. So, uh, well, actually, funny, most of it is, but we still sometimes use third party services for some things. But, right. um, yeah, no, for like the MGM thing, I'm sure that whatever they're going to do with it, they're going to use AWS to. What do you, what do you think about what do you think about that 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 deal? Smart smart deal? Like what do you think about that? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, confused. Though, like, I'm confused. I don't know why. I mean, we have we have Prime Video, which is a full-fledged scale um, movie production studio. You know, we're on all the different TV networks. It's its own channel. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we needed MGM. No, but I mean, if you have a catalog and then now you can put it on Amazon Prime and stuff like that, that's that's huge, you know, le legendary catalog. So yeah, that is they, true. they were saying that Bezos was eyeing that studio for a long time. Anyway, this was what he just, you know, oh, really? they, wanted, they wanted a different price, you know, so he just waited it out. I mean, when you have that type of leverage, man, you can just yeah. I mean, Amazon's trying to take over the world, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one yeah, more. No, thing seriously, they are. They are. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, what do you think about that? Let's let's talk about that. Like Amazon take over. What do you think about like the fact that you know people you know you guys are like the go-to for like resources you know you know like people go to, to google and you know but for like products and retail they go to amazon you know like literally you know we were just speaking about you know james might need an external <laughs> external camera right you Where's know it gonna uh, go, right yeah, yeah exactly let's you know you know let's talk about amazon and john has told me to go to amazon to get external stuff uh, external devices or our programs. So what do you what do you think about that that whole thing that like the whole human psyche kind of goes to you guys for products and seeing, you know, the best deals and you know Yeah. I think it's that. it's it's pretty cool that it's been able to do that. I think it's also a little scary. Um cuz I don't know. Yeah, I just think too much power in one place like that could become volatile. Um and uh I don't know. I think that's that we can get into a much bigger conversation about like um I don't know, the ability to sort of sway social norms when you have that much control. Like Bezos, you know, he owns a lot more than Amazon. You know, he has like his space division. He has the Washington Post, which is a massive media company. Right. Like if you control the media, you control a lot of the narrative in, in, in the world, you know? So right, right. kind of like, do you really want to focalize that much power in one place? I think it's cool and impressive that it happened and that he made that happen. Um, but I think it's also, again, just kind of kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right, so I mean, like you know, let's let's talk about like some of your other endeavors that you got going on because you're a man of different multi tools, and uh, let's let's talk about like how did you get connected with like the TikTok thing because you you do a lot of TikTok, and then we'll speak about your festivals that you've been able to yeah do. Like, totally what, what made you kind of get that because you're pretty popular on TikTok like you're like an influencer just about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't like that word personally, but um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I spent some time on there. Yeah, I started using it because so I'm a music artist myself as well. I produce um, and I before COVID, I was touring a little bit on the West Coast. Nice. Um, and so I got into TikTok because the hype, everyone was like, you got to be on TikTok, bro. You got to use it. You got to make these viral videos. My manager was like, you got to start making some videos of you producing, you know, so I kind of just started doing it that way. And then I had a couple multi-million view videos that were really stupid, to be honest. 
Um, but that, yeah, that kind of got me familiar with the platform. And then I have a um, social media marketing agency that I, that I run personally. Uh, so I have about five or six clients. And whenever we get into the conversation of content, we always explore TikTok. Um, Are, for you, you know, we, we, we interview a lot of like people on the, on the rise that are, are, are are you always looking for like new, like we, we interview a lot of artists who are on the rise and who are signed and stuff like that. And they're always looking for new avenues. Are you always looking for different partners and collaborations with different? Totally. Um, yeah. 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 Well. yeah. Let me know. Cause I have a, uh, I have a record label. It's called Storytime Records. It's been around since 2012 or 13. Um, and we, we release music from all kinds of independent artists. So yeah, yeah, definitely. we're always on the look for that new. Definitely, yeah. man. Um, let's talk about this, the festivals, man. How did you get into uh the festivals you know uh you know that that's 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 pretty dope like and are you are you are you have you have insurance like are you is it like a real professional festival or like how, how does that you know yeah. you're not talking about regular theaters or arenas and stuff like that well arenas are pretty big but yeah like were, yeah so i work for a couple different promoters um so for example insomniac events if you're familiar they do like edc which is in vegas it's like a hundred sixty thousand person uh festival um mm -hmm. And I work with like Hard Summer, uh, that's in San Bernardino. That's more of like a hip hop kind of festival. Nice. Um, Nocturnal Wonderland, uh, and then a couple other ones. I, I have a lot of personal connections to the people that own these companies. And so I kind nice. of travel and work with them. Um, the, uh, I got into it because I was a huge club guy growing up. Uh, right. when, I became, when I moved to Seattle, went to school, started at Apple, I decided I want to start DJing. Uh, so I got a local residency at a club met the owners, kind of escalated up through there, you know, and um, met, eventually I got to the, I, I got, I got to a sweet spot where I started working with um, uh, traveling artists. So we would, we would book the artists and they would fly out and perform and I would get to know them and their managers. Nice. And so that really helped me like spread out my network. Cause suddenly now I had Facebook friends and all over, all over the world. Right, you know? right, right, right. And so through that, I was able to get a lot more opportunities to work elsewhere. And that's how I got like Ninja Warrior, you know, this past, right. uh, this right. past season. So like, yeah, yeah, just all about networking, man. We can, we yeah. can on that for days. That, that, that's what it is, man. Um, I don't know. I mean, pretty much, you know, I, I really, I really wanted you on because we, we are a uh, business, uh, finance, econo economic and um, technology. I, I guess you can say technology podcast because we're doing a lot more technology type stuff, but, yeah. Um, you know, we definitely thank you for coming on, you know, speaking about the Amazon experience, speaking about the cloud, web, web cloud experience, just anything that, um, you know, everything that, that goes with that. James, do you have any other questions for Alex? Uh, it's just a quick one, kind of a, a frivolous probably, but I was curious how much does the uh, various government agencies use your uh, uh, services, uh, you know, like Social Security or DOD or any of those that have uh, uh, fairly extensive uh, websites? Do they use their own or do they, like others, uh, rent through you? So, yes, great question. Um, a lot of it is hush-hush, and so I don't know all of it. I will say mm -hmm. that up front. But I do know that we do partner with government organizations. We have a division called GovCloud which is uh -huh. a government uh, proprietary cloud that we host. So um, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult to use that. It's not really for the average user. It comes with a lot of other regulations, obviously for government use. Um, but I do know that uh, yes, the government uses Amazon AWS for cloud stuff. Um, but I do know there's also some sort of tension because as you can imagine, um, Amazon trying to be a customer focused company, they don't want to allow certain things to happen, but governments want certain types of visibility that, uh, you know, just causes some tension between it's like what happened with Apple and the privacy thing that they went through recently. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Verizon trying to go through and get every, you know, and, and I, think, with I think also and too, that. uh, they were, there was kind of like a rift with the Trump administration, if you know, you guys wanted that big defense. A uh, contract, and uh, he kind of he kind of went he pivoted to Microsoft. Oh yeah, that. yeah. I mean, all that, and then like I don't know if you guys remember the Parlor thing. Remember, you guys never used used Parlor or heard of that before? Yeah, I heard of Parlor, but I never used it. So that's, yeah, that's, it's like an alternative yeah. social media site, and yeah, it's, it's more conservative, conservative. For, for having a lot of these like Trump supporters that right, were right, conservative. you know that were causing certain things. It just got a bad rap in the press, and of course, it's hosted on Amazon. So people came to us and said like, "Hey, you got to shut these guys down." 
Like, you know, but then that, that came up the, the argument of, well, you know, they're using everything within the scope of what they're allowed to do. Right. They're the ones that have the users. They have to actually, you know, control their users more. Right. If they break our policies, then we're able to go in and, and take some action on that. And I think actually we did end up doing that. Um, but yeah, we have those kind of political stripes all the time. Yeah. I think I think it's a hard balance for you guys because you guys are trying to be a, like the moderator, like, you know, the referee. But it's like, I, you know, and I would I wouldn't even say referee. We're like we're like the, the soccer field. You know, we give you the soccer field. You guys right. come play the game. You know, we have right, rules right, that right. says don't don't uh, don't, you know, cut the grass without our permission. That's right. about it. You know, whatever they do on the field is on them. But then it's like, well, OK, well, here comes some kids and they're having a bonfire on the soccer field. So right, right, right. Got to tell them to stop. It's like, well, hey, look, they, they got it. They used it. They're borrowing it. They're paying right. for it. No. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard because now bothering it's like, the neighbors, okay. not bothering, you know, yeah. Right. So it's like, okay, like when when does it stop or when does when does it go? Like when is it go? you know what I mean? So it's like it's like yep. a thin line, man. It is but a very yeah, thin line. Very you know, we 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 just give out the information, you know what I mean? It's, it's up to you guys to take it if it's true or false or not, whatever, you know what I mean? So yeah, well it's like any, any software come, everyone's always like mad at Facebook for like um, you know, taking their information and stuff. It's like as soon as you sign up, you, it says, do you agree to their terms? Right, to the terms and conditions. Yes, that's right. going to happen. Right. Right. It's right. like, if you don't want that to happen, then just don't use Facebook. Like, that's <laughs> their program. Like, right, they right, can right. say whatever they want to say because they made it. Right. right? right. Yeah. I think, too, I think people also just kind of discouraged because they're like, okay, why do you have to say that in the terms and conditions? Mm, I think yeah. that's what it is. Like, okay, you can do certain things, but it's like, okay, why do you need to have those these certain policies in your terms and conditions? What's, what's the point of that? You know what I mean? And I yeah, think that's yeah. where it's more. Not saying that you can't have terms and conditions. It's just that, okay, what are you outlaying in your terms and conditions? Exactly. You know, that, that, is, that is the argument because it's like, why do you need this information about me? And right, exactly. Honestly, exactly. Honestly, it is not always for the best reasons. And that is just the fact, you know, but the right, fact right. is too that they say they're going to do it. So it's up to you to choose if you are going to use their platform because right. they're it's like they, there's, they, they say they're going to screw you over. So it's up to you to decide. Well, I mean, I think, I think also, too, they need that information to be able to program the algorithms, right? Like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, Google, you know, and it's, it's so mind boggling me. You know, you can go on YouTube and it'll, it'll, it, will, it will put it will, the algorithm will, will, will put videos to what you're, you're, you've watched in the past and totally you know, yeah. just align them. So that information is being collected somehow. It's just not saying oh you know you know the first time you come on no it's generating that information so it can give you the those, that that you know the information the type of video that you like or you oh yeah like, you Man, know, so the we, algorithms are always working yeah once you start breaking down like the osi layers and getting down to like what's being sent between these different devices like you actually can get a lot of information about somebody right. just from right. them going to your website like it's, absolutely it, that's what we do well alex man it was it was great having you you know, thank you for coming on to the EFR podcast. Um, do you want to like shout out, you know, your social media or something? You know, we always ask that, you know, for your socials or whatever. Sure. How can people yeah. get in contact with you and so. stuff? Totally. Yeah. My socials are just my first and last name. So it's at uh, Alexei Wayman, A L E K S E Y Wayman, W E Y M A N. Um, it might be in the caption in the post. Yeah. 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 Or at some point. Yeah. But, we'll put it, we'll put it everything in there. Um, yeah, man. I mean, we're having have, Thank you for having, I mean, thank you for coming on our show and just explaining the whole web, web cloud services. And, and yeah, hopefully, hopefully that, hopefully that was kind of what you were hoping for. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> you know, that's exactly what I was hoping for, man. Okay. You know, see those forums, those, those forums, man, they help, they help, man. But, um, you know, thank you for coming on. I really do appreciate, appreciate you. We, we're going to speak um, off the camera too, because I had, I, you know, stuff with the festival. Uh, you know, that's really dope that you're doing like stuff with the artists and, and you know, uh, social media content yeah. creators. And um, that's it, man. Yeah. We're signing off with the EFR podcast at Mr. Alex Wayman. I'm Sammy B along with James Lyman. And on the left, Mr. John Donlin, John Don, John the Don Sterling, uh, the EFR podcast, episode 39. Stay blessed. God bless. Yeah. See you later. I'm like an addict, do I gotta have it? I ain't even playing, got a really bad habit. If it moves, gotta grab it. Fuse like a magnet.